Hi everyone, this is Mrs. Spencer, and as part of our Sociology of Media Voices series, today I have the absolute incredible scrumptious pleasure of interviewing Mr. Tony K. Fretton. Now, Mr. Tony K. Fretton is the founder of Pacific X, an Australian Pacific Island LGBTIQA plus community organisation. He is a board member of the Victoria Samoa Advisory Council, Multicultural Ambassador for the Mental Health Foundation Australia and member of the Pacific Youth Workers Collective. He is passionate about Pacific Island storytelling for all mediums and cultural arts, lives in Nam on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, so-called Melbourne, Welcome, Tony K. Fretton, to our series. <laughs> it's an absolute honour to be here. Thank you, Ricky. So tell us a little bit about your story, Tony. Um, tell us about where you grew up. Absolutely, yeah. Well, this is... I've always wanted this moment to, like, an Oprah moment to speak about my life, so thank you so much for the opportunity. But, uh, no, I think for me, so I grew up in, um, in Melbourne and... Um, sort of northern suburbs of Melbourne and um, my life has been really around the creative um, sort of area. I've loved doing, I've loved like learning about um, our cultural arts and our artifacts and, and making things and arts and crafts and all that kind of stuff and so I've, um, that's been a sort of passion of mine throughout um, throughout my life but growing up I guess in the northern suburbs and throughout school volunteering has been a big thing for me so being able to volunteer and give time. Um, I think for me, I was always wanting to give back um, to the community in some form. And I mean, it was, it, was, it, it was organizations like the Salvation Army and the Smith family who sort of helped me and my family growing up. I mean, we didn't have much money and that sort of thing. And I'm being a migrant family and a new family to Australia. And so I've always sort of appreciated things like that. And um, my in my heart, it's like, a, if I could give back one day some somehow, I love to do that and um, all throughout sort of high school and I think my teenage years, it's all been about volunteering and I did things like youth magazines and um, I was like doing movie reviews on things and um, like Daffodil Day and all the all the different fundraising that the year that you can do, that was it. I signed up and I did that. So it was like Red Nose Day, if anyone remembers that. I don't think, I haven't seen that in a while, but um, all those kind of things are just really passionate for me. And, um, then sort of grew up and, um, you know, started discovering my sexuality and, um, and you know, my sort of gen gender identity and all that kind of thing. And I think for me, it was like, okay, well, maybe this could be a, a perfect mix of sort of working in the LGBTQIA plus area and also giving back time, but towards um, things that sort of benefit who I was as a kid that I probably didn't see growing up and a visibility for things uh, or people who are advocating um, that wasn't that who were, who weren't there at the time that I was growing up, and so I thought maybe this could be my role to sort of do that now. So for the for the for the younger people sort of coming up and growing up, and um, I felt that there was something missing, and so things like being involved with um, local council and 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 different areas like that. I think you really should. I mean, those things are valuable because these are the direct things around us and we live and breathe in these spaces. And so um, Pacific X came up um, out of that, so born out of just trying to create a little community. And we've really, really been blessed with all the amazing people. We've been up and running now for nearly close to four years. Um, trust, like as a non-for-profit, I mean, we had no money. Everything's still coming out of our pocket for everything. And we're still trying to like, you know, build things, but it's a growing um, you know, it takes time. And so um, I'm proud of the work that we've done, especially around advocacy and um, sort of standing up and, and bringing to light different issues around the Pacific Islands and for our diaspora community. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. And everything else, like I like long walks on the beach and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, um, that's it. That's pretty much me in a shell. So thank you. Oh, lovely. So let's just go <laughs> a little bit more about uh, Pacific X. Um, yeah. And how it is, what it's like for someone who's, who is of uh, Pacific Islander um, 
uh, heritage mm. to come out um, as LGBTIQA. Can you maybe right. tell our audience a little bit about what that's like for a young person who's part of Absolutely. who's enriching a very community and spiritual yeah. culture? From what I, I yeah. know of the beautiful Samoan culture, how does that sort of you know come to play for a young person? Who has these feelings and then finally realizes, yep, yeah, I'm definitely in part of right. the BTIQ. How does that sort of thing intersect between their culture, family, and identity? Yeah, no, that's beautiful. I love the way that you phrase that question because it is important when we're looking at coming from a culture that is community sort of focused because we are and many Pacific Island cultures are very community focused. The, the tricky part and I think the complex part, and I think we've all heard many sort of coming out stories from different cultures, the complex thing for us is that it's more difficult or there are more things, I guess, barriers in coming out in the diaspora community than it is in our island community. So we've got, so when we look at things like, and I encourage anyone, if anyone has a chance to ever visit Samoa, you'd walk around and you'd see in, in I guess, Western terminology, um, trans women and transgendered pe um, you know, men and women, they, they walk freely in the, like there's no, like it's, you're just part of the community. It's got nothing to do. I mean, yes, there's still stigma around things because of Christianity and because of colonization, but there is a difference between religion and living your religious life and then actually living in like the real world in the reality, just pretty much like in Australia where we say we're a Christian country, but I hardly see people go to church every Sunday. So it's like sort of a flip reverse side of that. Um, so we're dealing with a generation now and we're looking at first, second generation in the diaspora where our we have to create the skeleton and the framework around how um, how we're sort of dealing with coming out because in the past it's we've always sort of been included and been part of the community. Um, so, as a young sort of person here in Australia, my coming out story is comes with a lot of privilege because my family were very supportive about it. But that's not the case with many um, sort of younger people that we're meeting now. And it's things around Christianity, which is a huge part of our culture, um, that is sort of preventing that. And so our work really is trying to focus around how do we how do we balance between the ideals of Christianity, which is so ingrained in our culture, with trying to educate around um, who we are as a people and our history, which has been very inclusive. Um, so a young person coming out now very very different as well when we look at different islands different islands are very different as well so Samoa I guess it's a very um, I guess progressive in that sense but then we look at other smaller islands like even maybe Fiji um, or even at some cases like Tonga um, it's a very different experience and different barriers associated with each, each island and so it's very complex in that way and then even more is the complex of being a diaspora community and how we're sort of looking at, at it from that point of view. So for us, um, again, I could, to really, I can only talk about my story. My story was okay. People were shocked. And I think people were like, oh, you're gay? Okay, well, that's sad because you can't have children anymore and that sort of thing. And that was the big, that was the most disappointing thing to people was, um, or my, my close family was, like, oh, you're not going to have children and grandchildren. But apart from that, after the initial shock, a few weeks later, they were like, okay, we get it, or that's fine, as long as you're happy, you know, whatever. So my gener my, gen my, I speak from a lot of privilege, whereas a lot of other families do not have that. And so um, there's a lot of complex, yeah, very, very complex, very, very complex. But on the general, I guess if I look at it generally, um, it's more the Christian sort of faith-based families and communities that make it a little bit more trickier for our Pacific Island youth and, uh, and our younger ones coming out um, and exploring their gender and sexuality um, at this stage. So there's hope, but we need more stories. We need more positive stories. We can't keep, I mean, well, what we've had so much recently is just um, negative things, things that have, um, we could, our, our communities can only learn from hearing of positive coming out stories and things that actually can happen 
um, because it's just been trauma, 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 all these trauma, traumatic stories. And when you got, when you're a young family and like you're a young, like straight cis couple having children, and this is what you hear is what, how, how it's meant to be or how it has been, it models that sort of behavior. And so it's like, we need more positive stories of how you sort of came out, gender or sexuality. Um, and so our narrative really needs to change around. That's why important people like Latoya Herg for me, like Miss Catalina, um, like just uh, just so many other amazing people who are from our community who tell their story. Um, it really does resonate. It's going to create change. But um, we can't keep bragging on about. Um, and not only that, we can't also push away families who have been done an amazing job in, in embracing the LGBT kids. And there are so many stories of that. So for me, it's half, half. Yes, there is still a lot of work to do in um, breaking people's perceptions and minds in the diaspora community, but also there are so many amazing stories which can only encourage more of that in our community. And I think that's where we're sort of at right now. Wow, that's fantastic. And tell me with Pacific X, um, do you find that you have now younger people approaching that from your community, Pacific Islander communities that want to connect? It's a, it's it's very yeah. So we do, and I guess out of the majority of the younger people who sort of connect in, it's actually a big surprise, Ricky. I mean, for me, we thought we set it up with the intention to be like, okay, look, this is gonna be um, um, if we're visible, if we're out there, and all this kind of you know just being visible it's going to people that we can help will come and reach out towards us but no we're actually what we're finding is that those who are actually really really comfortable and are really really sort of set in who they are and as as, as young people they're the ones reaching out because they've got the confidence to do so the one we still have this great area where those in the closet and those who are still early they'll reach out to individuals but in our group but they weren't like um, send a generic email directly to our group. So just us being visible as a collective, um, it's helpful. And I think we found with young people, it's like, I'm not going to, they, it's more confident for them to be like, let me connect to just someone from Pacific X instead of let me connect to the organization, which I think that's the mind frame of how we need to build our, I guess, um, our skills, our individual skills as a collective, um, you know, how to do counseling, how to probably like just be up to date information. That's where our, um, that's where our focus needs to be because what we're seeing in our community is again, like I mentioned, people are, if they see someone in the group, they'll, they'll approach someone, but they won't approach the organization in general. So that's been a big, huge um, learning curve for us and how to sort of switch where we focus our, um, strategy as a group um, but yeah um, we've uh, probably in like three years probably only three young people have reached out directly and it's only been through their case manager or their caseworker um, but the majority of the younger ones reaching out they're reaching directly to people that they've seen visibly in Pacific X to be like oh hey sis I saw you you were at the pride march are you um, are you transgender woman and then they'll have a discussion that way. And so I get feedback from people in the group who come back and go, wow, they saw me and then they reach out to me and then we were having a talk and we're having a conversation. But it's, again, it's just the, the conversation starter. So to answer your question, no, not directly, but indirectly, yes. So it's really important, isn't it, that we understand how important that communities work yeah. in harmony. Absolutely. In and sort of have like the crossover that people can access, so like your uh, organization through connections and building that uh, wonderful relationship. And, and going on to those wonderful relationships, you're also a board member of the Victorian Samoa Advisory Council. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. Yep, so the Victoria Samoa Advisory Council, it's the longest standing Samoan sort of organization that sort of represents our Samoan community here in Victoria. And so they're connected directly with the our Samoan High Commission and they represent the Samoan people when it comes to things that related to anything to do with the Samoan community to the state. Um, and 
in terms of community engagement, uh, a lot of events or a lot of things around language, culture, arts, like community groups will approach VICSAC, or the, that's the short term name of it, and be like, hi, Victoria Council, we're wanting to do this. Um, or they'll approach them and say, look, is this culturally sensitive? Are there things that you can support us with in terms of cultural protocols um, and that sort of thing? My involvement has been mainly in the administration side, but organizing of our Independence Day that happens every year um, in June um, and a lot of our cultural sort of events that we run, things like tattoo um, exhibitions and art exhibitions um, and language. We've got, a, we've got a language school now that's based out of SiteWorks in Brunswick. So we've got, again, with the, the reconnection to culture, we've got a lot of our diaspora culture whose parents and even my parents well, like, just speak English because you're not going to, Samoan language is not useful for you in this world. This is here in Australia. And so because of that, a lot of us are starting to lose our language because our parents are sort of, I mean, our, there was a generation where we were told, don't learn English oh, first. Yes. Um, and so there's, now we're looking in the last, I guess, when lockdown began last year, we started online online language classes and the variety of ages of people in there is really fantastic. We're looking at from our youth all the way up to a mature age um, cohort of community who are learning, connecting back to language. But it's not only that because we have two types of language in Samoa. It's our everyday collo colloquial language yes. and then our respectful form of language. And so we're, it's the higher in-depth part of our language that um, there's a really big disconnect and so we're we're doing things like that so it's language culture um, sports so they run a, a yearly Samoan cricket tournament um, and then they run a lot of social events to get to keep um, the community together and the so the Victoria Samoan Rising Council yeah I think they've been around now for nearly 30 years and it started from a group of pastors or ministers of churches, but it's now just become everyone in the community to, to join and be part of this um, organization. So yeah, it's, they do really fantastic things. Um, and they've got a website as well that was launched last year and they got funding from the government. But yeah, really, really great, grateful to be part of that and to be part of just hearing all of the community things that are happening because of being, because of the exposure to that committee. Wow, that's, fa that's absolutely fabulous because obviously it really draws on that intergenerational connection between young, young people and older people, really sort of creating a, a kind of energy that really keeps that language maintenance going. Absolutely. So the younger generation can understand the richness of, of the Samoan languages and cultures right. so that new younger generations can be proud and embrace that um, and you know, celebrate its uh, wonderful yeah. uh, connections to the past. Which Absolutely. Can never be forgotten, you know, and she always. Absolutely. Be Absolutely. And, you know, learning things like that through the council, we've been able to sort of like, I guess, copy and paste, but use the same teachings in how we, so we don't run an organization typically as like a normal organization. I guess we've got standard rules as, you know, being registered, but we run it in a very Pacific Island way. So even in Pacific X, the focus on intergeneration is very important. So we've got our elders who are talking to our younger ones and being their mama or their dad that they never had as a fafafine, you know, person, and then being able to share the experience of being a fafafine in Melbourne, in navigating this space that we're in, it's so, so valuable. And I think it goes back, I think it's this thing about community where I think a lot of people, I think everyone can sort of relate to um, situations where you've sort of got that older brother or older sibling or other older sister and having like, your chosen family, that's, I guess, the core of Pacific X, and that's what I'm really, really proud of. Well, that's that's just amazing that that's developed over the four years and obviously yeah. growing really strong and now having more of a, I guess, greater visibility and presence to, uh, I guess, mainstream LGBTIQ events such as, um, you know, Pride festivals yeah. and, and uh, Mardi Gras. And it's really showcasing that, um, you know, just beyond uh, white uh, privileging uh, spaces, we now really are understanding that it's so important within our uh, LGBTI community that we really support and 
really celebrate the richness of different cultures and uh, different languages of love and connection that we have together. And, you know, and also having relationships with people closer to people of different um, uh, nationalities and, and, and just being able to share the experience and connect us. That was what makes us human. And let, let's now go on to your um, your other role, which you've done, which is the Multicultural Ambassador for the Mental Health Foundation. So how did you, what, what sort of work do you do in that space, Tony? Yeah, so um, this, um, yeah, being part of the, they've got, through the Mental Health Foundation Australia, they've got this program where they've sort of engaged a lot of different people from different multicultural backgrounds. And, um, and I guess the, I guess the whole purpose really is around, primarily number one is around awareness and, and being able to connect people to appropriate links within um, different cultural groups. Um, for me, I guess my work in that is being able to identify and sort of put together, and I'm working on this only now, because I've only been part of the organization for nearly two years. Um, and it's taken a while because of lockdown, I think lockdown just cancelled out one entire year, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's putting together, I guess, um, a range of services that are um, for for our Pacific Island community that know the terms in the languages and understand the cultural sensitivities, um, and then trying to map out sort of a little my own little directory to be able to to pass out. But not only that, it's encouraging. I run a Facebook social group. In Melbourne, which is just for the Samoan community, and we've got about nine thousand people on there active. Um, so I run a nine thousand group of just wow. you know all genders. Or, yeah, yeah. And so for that, I think I was selected to the social media point. But the reality is, social media is so important in our daily lives that sometimes um, a way of distributing information, um, social media has been really great at doing that. And so for me, it's been constantly give, you know giving appropriate culturally sensitive information around mental health and where to get support and that sort of thing um, I'm not a trained um, psychologist or clinical anything like that but it's about look if you need information I can give you the best that I've got and so it's around um, yeah um, the most successful thing I guess throughout that was encouraging a lot to do things like the Movember month for men's health and um, that's important in our culture because I think of many others as well when men don't speak and they've got to be a tough guy and they've got to be tough and so we're seeing a high level of suicide rate and and uh, uh, sorry I didn't have a, 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 a trigger warning but um, things like that but even relationship and, and um, things around mental health and how to deal within families and family units and so that's been really great and my being part of Mental Foundation Australia, it's getting all the up-to-date information all the time to be able to distribute that, but then also set up events where we look around um, how do we bring awareness to mental health within Pacific Island cultures. So that's been really great. A lot of it has been online so far. So just Talanoa, and which is our version of just a, a, like a yarning sort of like um, group circle. Um, and that's been really great so far. Um, but hopefully, you know, if we can see people in, in, in face to face, we can do more fun things and I really can't wait for that, like um, hula on the beach and um, doing hair cutting or um, some sport days, but we'll get there. So fingers crossed, if everything works out, we'll be able to do a little bit more around mental health. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, and again, I'll be loving to hear that too when it goes on further and, and to talk to you more about you're working that space. Yeah. It's quite exciting to hear that, that, that how your community can connect through the use of um, a digital platform like Facebook. Yeah. That, that you get, especially for having 9,000 people. I guess now we we'll kind of want to know a little bit more about Tony and your work <laughs> around what has driven you to be more artistic. Um, Self. So tell me a little bit about your style of artwork. Well, a lot of my artwork, it's it's really, really, it's it's been really, I guess, therapeutic for me. And so it's never been about um, let's create art and put it out there in a gallery. And what I've really focused on a lot really has been lino printing. Um, so I do a lot of that because I guess for me, 
when I was in school and we we're learning about all different methods of art, that was the one that gravitated the most to me because it was similar to carving and um, and I guess with carving and being able to carve out tattoo patterns. Um, and for those who don't know, the word tattoo comes from the Samoan word tatao. Um, and we've had exhibitions around um, the Immigration Museum run an amazing one around um, Pacific Island tattooing. And so for me, it's been really around the symbol, like the symbols of Pacific Island symbols and the ways that they sort of use that. And so for me, yeah, that's been my thing. It's, it's therapeutic too. Like if if anyone's ever done liner printing, I don't know about you, but I find it like it's it's my version of the, you know that coloring book where they have the all those beautiful patterns? Like yes, yes, that people yeah. have now used as therapy in all of workspaces, yes. Yeah, yes, it's like that. Like it, that, it's, that's what it was for me. And I guess for me around sort of growing up in anxiety, that was my sort of little escape was carving for hours and hours and hours into lino and I'm pretty sure there's like a bathroom in the old house that we're at that doesn't have lino anymore because of me. But um, yeah, that, that's sort of my sort of passion around that. But I'm getting into some of the new technological things. So the drawing through iPads have been really cool and I'm only starting to learn that now. But um, for me, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm an artist. It's, it's my passion but I love everything about our cultural arts and that, that inspires me because of the being, like an artwork holds an entire story and that's what I value about it. And that's what I value about our art. Uh, it's really the deeper meaning. So yeah, that's that's my view on that. <laughs> oh, lovely. And Tony, if anyone would love to have a look at your artwork or do you have a website? Or exploring or no, not yet. I, 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 I think maybe soon. I think I'm going to get enough courage to post things. But I, um, transitionally for me, like I'm, I'm in between moving houses as well. So once that's settled and I can take proper pictures, it should be up soon. But I'm getting confidence to be able to share some of these things. A lot of them are, are really personal, but it will come. I promise. I, I promise I will share. <laughs> I look forward to that day. We can put them up on our website. <laughs> And really enjoy the beautiful um, text ah, and passion that come from the soul <laughs> and from your ancestors that will come through yes. in your work. As I'm a big believer in uh, uh, a cultural history that comes through the soul to the work of artists. Beautiful, Tony Breton, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you on our series. And as we part, would you like to maybe just give us some parting words? about what it means to be um, someone of Samoan heritage as part of the LGBTIQ community. Oh, absolutely. Well, again, thank you for, for letting me be part of this. And my encouragement is to everyone, really. I mean, coming from my point of view, I've really found our community to be a community to be such an amazing um, and inspirational one. And I think my words is really stay away from, I guess, um, all this, all, all different negative things that you hear about, th different things and social media and all this other extra noise, but connect with people because trust me, our community has the most amazing and inspirational people that you will ever meet and that's going to guide you for the rest of your life. Reach out. There will be people that are going to reach back. Well, that's fantastic. And if you are all interested, we will be posting on our links um, to Pacific X that you can get in touch with Tony or if you are of someone of a Pacific Islander descent or you have friends who want to connect and feel lonely, um, isolated or just want to make new friends, um, please direct them to the Pacific X website and I'm sure Tony and his community will be more than happy to welcome and provide you the information. Thank you so much for everyone for listening to our podcast. And Tony, as you leave, can you please give us some Goodbye words in Samoan, Samoan language. Ah, okay, all right. Um, oh, that's absolutely beautiful. Thank you, my darling. Always a pleasure. <laughs>